the Joe Rogan experience. Again, I, I keep going back to that one point, which is it doesn't really matter what the facts are anymore. It does. It as an example, today was now I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, but today was uh, uh, hearings up on the hill. Uh, the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee was holding hearings. So who did they have? They had Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. They had uh, uh, CENTCOM Commander uh, General McKenzie, great guy. They had uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Milley. So they all, to, to, the, to the last one, said, yes, uh, we were advising the president that um, th- you know, our advice is to maintain a small troop presence, minimum of 2,500 troops right, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and our belief was not that it would collapse as quickly as it did, but that it would collapse if you took those advisors, those troops out, that it would collapse maybe by fall, this fall. Um, and yet you've got the president saying, I don't recall being told any of that. And that's okay now because no, and, and nobody's questioning it, right? Nobody's saying, saying well, well, hold on. No, how about some pushback? How about saying, what do you mean you don't recall? This is one of the most important decisions you've made or will be making. And you don't recall whether your senior top military advisors were telling you that in their ad- advice, keep the troops in there for a period of time. And he's saying, I, I don't remember. And there's really no serious pushback. This whole hearing, if anybody wants to know what Washington, D.C. is like and how that city runs, I'd recommend maybe on Thursday watching some more of these hearings uh, on the Afghanistan process because it's just, on one hand, it's very depressing. It's just a shit show. You've got the senators on the Armed Services Committee who have been there, who have been privy to all sorts of intelligence over the past few years, right? Now, sitting in a hearing to understand what happened, what went wrong with the Afghan withdrawal, and they're all acting as if, you know, they could be surprised by this. When, when these politicians have been sitting up on Capitol Hill, being briefed on this shit, having the opportunity to ask questions, doing all the things they should be doing, but now because it's all theater, now they get to sit in a hearing in front of some of this, the senior military commanders and act as if they're a little bit surprised by all of this. And, oh, my God, how did it happen? How can we prevent it from happening again? Senator Gene Shaheen actually asked that. I think it was of Millie saying, well, you know, well, how do we prevent this from happening again? Are you fucking kidding happening me? Happening again? Yeah. That's your question? Jesus yeah. Christ. Anyway, it's, it, 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 it's, I tell you what, it, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a fascinating period so, of time. Let me ask you this. So the, the president has the ability to say whatever the, you know, like, so if, if someone advises him to leave 2,500 troops, he has the ability to say, I don't think so. No troops. Yes, yes, he does. So he can take all that advice and... And the military leaders are saying, look, we, we provided this advice. Right. And it is. I, I think it does surprise people sometimes um, when they see the extent. And if they if they were watching these these hearings and understanding the information flow about Afghanistan, look, there was a lot of talk. Right. And yeah. in the aftermath of this withdrawal clown show um, that, you know, what what happened? Who was advising who? How did we miss certain pieces of intelligence? And there's a lot to uh, to figure out there. But. The idea that that the president would sit there in his in his office uh, with all these senior advisors around, and they would say, "Sir, here's here are your options," because that's always basically what they're doing. And theoretically, they, you know, they they are supposed to be strong enough to argue their point as strongly as possible, right? They're not there to just go along. So they, you know, they all come in. They say, "We think you should be, you know, keeping troops in there." And the president then steps away, and now Millie. McKenzie, the others, they all said that Biden listened very, you know, seriously to them. But there was a political decision here, right? That political decision was, we're getting the hell out. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Biden, um, he kind of wants to have it both ways, right? He wants to take credit for being brave and saying, we're getting the hell out, right? But then he also wants to blame the previous administration for the reason why he had to be getting the hell out. Right, so he wants to blame the Doha agreement that Trump signed in February of 2020. And what was that? Well, that was when, when the Trump administration made a deal with the Taliban and in, in, uh, in February of 2020. And basically it had conditions within that. And, and, and uh, General Milley and McKenzie talked about those conditions, I think, uh, today. And they're in the hearings, actually. Um, there were seven conditions placed on the Taliban for this agreement to go forward. 
and there was a May withdrawal date. Now, the administration, the previous administration, and people don't want to hear this shit, right? Because they're so entrenched in their own camp, right? So people who are on the, the hard left, they're not going to want to hear the fact that the Doha agreement was based on conditions, right? But the, the most senior military commanders today reaffirmed that, yes, there were seven conditions for that agreement to follow through, for us to follow through. We had eight conditions for the U.S. And now, during the course of the discussions and the negotiations, and this whole agreement was based on a power sharing. The idea was we want to create an opportunity for the Taliban and the, the Afghan government. We want them all to come together and create a power sharing agreement. Well, uh, you know, uh, on one hand, you could argue and say that's that's never going to happen. Sounds crazy. Yeah, it sounds crazy. But that's that's where they were. And you could also argue, and again, you know, because people are so entrenched, no one's want to give any credit to whether they want to give credit to Biden or they want to give credit to Trump or any Republican president or Democrat president. Uh, you know, the Trump administration did kind of broker the hard, uh, heavy lift of saying, we're getting the hell out, right? There had been talk around the edges in previous administrations about well, how long we're going to be there, right? But the Trump administration did finally actually say, fuck it, let's get a negotiation, let's go, and let's set a time, time to get the fuck out after 20 years. Right or wrong. So they, they put that on the table. They set the table for, for that, you know, hard line withdrawal. But... The Taliban never met those conditions. The only thing they did was not attack U.S. troops directly. But as Milley and Mackenzie said today, they never met any of the other conditions. So it had been explained to the Taliban that if that was the case and you don't meet these conditions, we're not going to leave in May. We're going to just keep pushing the, the, uh, the withdrawal date further to the right. So why was the decision made to withdraw then? Well, look, in part, I think because... Uh, I think everybody got behind the idea that we can't stay there forever because I think everybody, you know, understood that it just wasn't happening. They weren't buying what we were selling. They never have, right? I mean, and, and you don't want to be completely fatalistic all the time, but it, with Afghanistan, it's not a bad, it's not a bad frame of reference to remember all the other times that things like this have failed. And so the idea that somehow we were going to build a stable, pseudo democratic government in Afghanistan was always flawed and it was there was never really any evidence to show that that was going to happen and it was propped up and i think nobody really wanted to tell the truth um in positions of leadership whether it was military or government or intel community and so i think there was general agreement that yeah we gotta we gotta get the fuck out uh and then it came down to well how do we do that Right? And we faced some of the same problems that the old Soviets faced getting the hell out of Afghanistan. But I think with this case, you know, part of it was we had pulled advisors off the Afghan units, you know, two, three years ago. Right? That had been a process. So the withdrawal process had been going on for a number of years, you know, over the past decade or so, you know, in a sense, right? We'd been drawing back, pulling out some resource, pulling out troops, lowering the troop numbers, um, putting more responsibility on contractors. And once you take the advisors out of the Afghan units, right, in a sense, you don't have really eyes and ears, right, inside the Afghan military. So you can have, you know, President Ghani or, you know, some bullshit Afghan commander just telling you whatever you want to hear. But you didn't have a lot of folks at ground level, working with the troops, saying, all right, this shit's not going to hold, right? Particularly after the Doha agreement, right? Once I think that the Doha agreement was made, I think the writing's on the wall, and even the Afghan military could see it, right? And they could read it, and they could say, okay, this shit's not going to happen. We're not going to keep getting money. We're not going to keep getting advisors, and uh, we're not going to get the air support that is really the only thing that keeps us in, in, in power. So, you know, at some point over a period of a few years, we, or we were degrading our own ability to, to actually understand just how bad it was getting, right? And um, so then it became a logistical exercise. You got to move personnel and you got to move material out of the country. And that's where you could argue it all kind of went sideways. Well, they left behind how much shit? A lot of shit. A lot of shit. Mm -hmm. Crazy shit, right? No, we left. We left. Blackhawks. Uh, yes, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars as a conservative estimate. Uh, Why? 
That's a conservative estimate. Well, because uh, partly because you could argue that um, some of the material was decommissioned. You know, some of the heavier platforms were uh, made non-functioning. Okay, fine. Um, I don't know. To answer the question, I don't know why the military wouldn't have moved more of the gear, the the the, the light gear out there. In other words, the the night vision devices, the the uh, the, the weaponry, right? The small arms, uh, ammunition. Why not spend three or four months right. getting that gear the hell out? Right? You don't have the troops to, to that that require them. Right. So now you've got all this shit stored. Now the the thought could have been that this is for the Afghan military. They're going to hold. But here's the here's the thing that that interesting point that came out from General Billy and General McKenzie w- during these hearings is that they claim they're stating, and I have no reason not to believe them, they're stating that the general consensus by the fall of 2020, right, was that without the troops in there, once you take the U.S. troops out and the um, and and the money, then uh, the government's going to collapse. Probably by fall of this year. And right? it took like three hours. Yeah, it took like, it took, yeah, it took 11 days. Now, in, in a classic piece of Washington speak, I think it was uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in answering a question said, no, we never saw any assessment that said that the government would collapse in 11 days. He's very specific, right? He's not saying uh, in short Period. order. Yeah. He's just saying 11. I didn't see one for 11 days. I say that we had one for like two weeks. But uh, So that's, that's, that's just the shit that happens on the, on the side. So they first. assumed that the Afghan army eventually was not going to fight the Taliban. Yes. Yeah. So there was what they're saying is we all – and look, the intel community, we've been talking about that for years. We, we knew – all you had to do was study the, the, the Soviet papers during their time, their occupation in Afghanistan to understand how we were likely going to replay that scenario. And we did, right? So, you, you know, you could argue that uh, what should have happened was years ago, we should have looked around and thought, this is a bullshit exercise, right? Doesn't mean that the, that, you know, and I think the military today, uh, the senior commanders today, and during this week, I think you'll see them make a huge effort to say, first and foremost, the veterans uh, and, and everyone who fought there and, and, and all the, the, the hardship, it was, wasn't in vain. I think they're going to focus on that. It, it, and they're going to say, because for two decades, uh, the, you know, we haven't been attacked on our home soil. And in a narrow definition, yes, that's why we went in. And then it kind of got blown up into this idea that we were going to create you know, like this this bastion of democracy in yeah. Afghanistan. But it's been widely known forever that Afghanistan is insane. Like it's impossible to manage. Yeah, the Soviets couldn't handle it. You know, the the the, the whole area is incredibly mountainous. Like it's very remote. It consists of these little clans that are run right. by warlords. Like it's not a like Kabul is essentially the only real city, right? Yeah, there, are there are other cities there's, there? There's, that are real cities? There are, but there are. It, they're they're still run like little fiefdoms, and and like fiefdom uh, you know, is a good word. Fief, I know, right? I, don't, I like how you pulled that out. Write that down. Write Hold that on one down. Fiefdom. I don't. Well, no, I, I can't. Know I don't know how to spell it. It's like something from uh, The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> what is a fiefdom? Do you know what a fiefdom is, Jamie? Watch the entire episode for free only on Spotify.